The outgoing Prime Minister of Lesotho, Dr. Mwakezi Manjoro, has announced his intention to recall the Parliament to complete the national reforms process. Now, the life of the 10th Parliament expired on the 15th of July, leading to a collapse of the ongoing process to promulgate the key reforms bill into law. Prime Minister Majoro says that he wants Lesotho removed from the regional body SADAC's agenda. The development partners and friends of Lesotho will be keenly following the unfolding of this process ahead of the SADAC summit on the uh, coming weeks. And we will make recommendations to both chairs, the chair of the organ on politics, defense and security of SADAC, it is a chain of events in 2014 that led the regional body SADAC defining Lesotho's situation as one with the political security deterioration that has led to fleeing of opposition leaders fearing for their lives. With the reality worsening following a tragic death of former commander of the Lesotho Defense Force, Mabangwe Mahao. SADAC then intervened and called for urgent key national reforms. But the failure of the 10th parliament to promulgate those bills into law is posing possible new threats to the kingdom. The electoral amendment bill 2022, which paved way for use of the Lesotho National Identification Card for voting, it included also provisions that would regulate floor crossing and provisions that would regulate how proportional representation seats are allocated in parliament. It also contained provisions that would open up voting in Lesotho to the Basudu diaspora outside Lesotho, they estimated at at least 400,000 people who have an interest in voting in Lesotho. The other legislation is the 11th Amendment to the Constitution of Lesotho. It's also known as the omnibus legislation because it amends in one legislation several clauses of the Constitution of Lesotho. Now that particular product, that particular instrument is an outcome of a long journey that in recent times began in 2014 uh, following SADAG intervention after political conflicts erupted in Lesotho. Majoro says Lesotho cannot afford to be on the agenda of SADAC and any further excuses and failure to implement these reforms may reverse the gains made by the kingdom. Uh, in a few weeks, I'll be reporting uh, to SADAC. I want that meeting to be the meeting in which Lesotho occupying his chair it's occupying its normal position. I would like Lesotho uh, to be removed from the agenda of SADAC. There's a lot of hope around the world. Lesotho has resurrected its credibility in the last few years. And this, this is a setback in that process. Lesotho is already participating in assisting other SADAC, ma SADAC members. But to then have to endure what happened is a painful process, but it is not a problem that we cannot solve. But Sotho are coming together, uh, we will solve this process. So my job now is to go and uh, ensure that pa Parliament is recalled. It's a legal process. I'm going to walk the, uh, that process. I thank you. 
Well, for the latest uh, on this uh, particular issue, we're now joined uh, by our correspondent uh, in Lesotho, Rapalang Khadebe. Rapalang, thanks so much indeed for joining us. I, I guess the constitution and its interpretation is really going to be key here, whether the recall uh, to whether to recall Parliament or not. Indeed, in the repeat, I can do maybe some. I, I told you, the city is going to get quite interesting in times to come. And we now about to see, I think, history being made here. Um, look, when the 15th of July marked the end of the 10th parliament, uh, the question that stood out was whether the process of the omnibus deal that had been undertaken, does it now automatically just fall off? And if not, what instruments could be used to try and resuscitate the process? Because definitely that would not go down well with a lot, with lots of friends of Lesotho, with those who supported the process. And indeed, ordinary Lesotho who were consulted in the reforms process, um, you know, South African government had a lot of stake wanting to stabilize the situation. This, after a lot of instability, politically and security, took place. Now, does it mean the fall of parliament ended that particular process? This is where now I think the legal experts will come into play. The section 82 read, subsection 2 read with section 23, subsection 1 of the constitution says, His Majesty may, as advised by the Council of State, recall parliament. And there were, the question is whether is there a state of emergency because the interpretation thereof says um, in, in case there is a threat to the country um, or other calamities of, of sort, could that warrant that the, His Majesty can then rely on that section mm. to recall the parliament? And this is where the debate is going to come. All right, so with the election date now announced, I mean, how's all this going to play out? It, it is interesting because this is the process that we have been waiting to see which one is going to come first. But when the elections, indeed, according to law, says as soon as the, the parliament uh, shuts down within seven days at least, the election date must be announced. So, so far, we are still within the parameters of the of the constitution. Mm -hmm. Now, clearly it now says the only way to extend the life of that parliament or to resuscitate whatever laws that were in the process is now to activate that state of emergency. And it is where the legal experts will be. But we have seen that um, IEC is afoot with the plans of now uh, having signed the code of conduct. Uh, they are calendar the schedule is now in process. There, is, there has been lots of bills that depended on the process, the new process that they anticipated, and there, there would be a lot of reversal if, if things now turned upside down. But we now really hope and believe that, I think that so we can come together and understand that whatever it takes to recall the parliament to come and finish the process, uh, failing which there could be a larger threat even more than that of mm. war as the constitution says should the parliament not be reconvened to complete the process all right you mentioned the uh, code of conduct it sounds as if some people had issues signing it what were their main concerns there yeah um, well look some will always be dramatic about things politicians will always want a camera opportunity to raise their concern. But some of them were pretty legitimate. One gentleman said uh, he's aware that there are media practitioners who are in the payroll of some politicians. And he says, if that particular so-called journalist shows up in our meeting, in our campaign trail, we know they do not have our interests at heart. And he blatantly said, what happens if we deal with him decisively? because we know we need to protect journalism, we need to have free flow of information and freedom of speech. But how does IEC deal with quarrels, with issues like this one? 
such that we can say the process has been free and fair because we, we now suspect that there are those media houses who will follow a particular direction and not be just plainly uh, journalists that can report the truth and nothing else. So I think some of those concerns were rather were legitimate. And it's how IEC, they set the date that I think in next Tuesday, they will call all the political leaders, deal and iron out some of these issues and actually give direction as to how they will deal with the situation if it arises. But importantly, I yeah. think um, 95, if not 100, 98% of those who are attended, <laughs> by the way, Lesotho registered 65 political parties that will be contesting these elections. And we are talking to a population of less than 2 million. My goodness gracious me. All right, so the IEC itself raised the issue of a lack of funds. Has that been resolved? Yeah, that, that, that was, I think, actually somebody raised, I believe somebody raised that particular issue on, on that day and said they are aware that IEC has not been allocated funds. There has been issues that IEC itself admitted that it is working with a very stringent budget. Uh, to the budget that it previously had to do elections, that budget was with, was whittled. Uh, it was, I mean, uh, almost a quarter of it. But now they say even the approved budget that has been uh, promised, only one third of the budget has been allocated to them. And the question is, how do they now start to implement the plans that they have? Because they have several streams of people doing different activities and they all require money even if you try to cut uh, the budget and hope that you can somehow balance for later uh, they were saying it looks almost impossible but they said they are committed they are willing to do the job um, but we hope the issue of budget will not uh, be blamed at some point for having elections that were not well prepared for by the IEC. Mm. There's a concern, I guess, uh, the Prime Minister um, perhaps uh, being able to um, activate the uh, state of emergency. Is there a compelling argument for him not to abuse that opportunity? Oh, well asked. <laughs> uh, you see, every time a sitting prime minister or president uh, is faced or wants to exercise the issue of state of emergency, it means all powers are now fall under his, uh, in his wings. And there is an open opportunity to abuse that. And that is why the constitution really makes all means that it is not easy or it is not possible for the prime minister to activate that. But if you look at the magnitude of the pending uh, situation facing the Soto ahead, in the next few weeks, the Soto will be reporting to SADAC the reforms that started in 2014, really. And for them to come up with an excuse that the end of parliament cut short the process might not be very acceptable. So I doubt the Prime Minister would even think of abusing the powers. Well, for example, one would say Prime Minister Majoro is probably the most uninterested sitting Prime Minister. He's not contesting elections. He's not the leader of the party. Um, he is in government and has already attained his Prime Minister's benefits. So, so really, um, I think all he has now is to leave at least a legacy that says he rescued the situation when it mattered most. Uh, his legacy as a two-year prime minister, almost a caretaker prime minister, the best he can say is to push and push such that when he finally gets out of that office, he can at least say he delivered the much-needed 
anticipated Basutu national reforms. I think it, he has more interest. He's probably the only person right now, politician, who can honestly say he wants to see those reforms passed. If anything else, I doubt abusing his powers or some were complaining that he might suddenly now postpone the elections. Uh, but I think we have had all the assurances that when this uh, state of emergency is activated, it should not be more than two weeks. Three weeks maybe at most, because one of his complaints was that um, some of the laws, having been adopting the New Zealand mo mo model, uh, were, were just clapped together, I think, because of time. And he really thought the expertise could have helped such that there is not much resistance or rejection. All but right. there were also other quarters from... Date, we're going to have to leave it there, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, Kele right. thank I you so it. much. Right. Thank you so much. That's our correspondent in Lesotho, uh, uh, Rappelang Khadeva, giving us an update on developments there.